first of all, thank you very much for coming to listen. Um, my name is Bob Hardwick, and as James has said, I'm Deputy Head of Palmerston Grant School um, in Portland, and um, I've been a pastoral deputy uh, in Paul for about 15 years now. Um, so, some experience of pastoral issues and pastoral matters. What I'm going to say uh, today is that, and I'm going to paraphrase it by saying that, we don't have all of the answers. Um, and I, I'm definitely going to say uh, that we certainly uh, don't hold ourselves up as a, a paragon of virtue in terms of how we deal with things. Um, because certainly over the years, certain things have happened, and we have, along the 15 year journey that I've been a pastoral deputy, there have been mistakes, and I'm quite happy to admit that. Um, but we have tried uh, over the last few years to try and improve the way and develop the way in which we have handled mental health issues and eating disorders in particular. Um, I've sort of structured my, my talk to you uh, in two different parts. It's important for me to set a context to you, first of all, um, as to the context of the school and the context as far as we understand it in terms of eating disorders. And then, from that, to then go on to explain how we feel we handle the issue of eating disorders and to try and minimise the impact of eating disorders within a school setting that we particularly have. Because I think the context is, is very, very important. Um, as we know, Eating disorders, sadly, is, is on the rise. There is no question. Um, in my 15 years as a pastoral deputy, I've seen mental health issues increase significantly um, within the school and throughout other schools within the borough. Um, and the pressure that uh, mental health services are under uh, within the borough is very, very significant now. There is no denying the fact that mental health services are under very, very severe pressure. And the pressure is coming through more and more frequently as we go through. So what about the context of our particular school? And please don't get me wrong, I'm not holding this up um, to show how brilliant we are. It's really not that at all. First of all, we are a secondary school, and that we know from the research that has been done that the average age at which eating disorders tends to appear, the average age is between the ages of 16, 15, 16, and 19 years of age. That is, tends to be when there is a peak surge in eating disorders. So therefore, we have one factor that is significant within the context of that particular school. Secondly, we are all girls. And that is another significant factor in our setting in terms of eating disorders. Because from research that's been carried out, we know that experiences of eating disorders tends to be higher amongst girls, females, than it does males. Although, having talked to somebody much earlier on um, this afternoon, I do fear about eating disorders amongst males and the hidden time bomb that is there amongst males in its existence at the moment. We're a large school. We have 1,250 students, particularly since the age of transfer change um, last year. So we are a large school. So we have a large number of students who are all girls in a secondary school. And the final factor is that we are a high achieving academic school. And I'm not putting those figures up 
for any other reason to demonstrate that we are academically very successful. It tends to be, therefore, that our school can be suggested to be a target school in terms of eating disorders because there are a series of factors that are in there that would suggest that eating disorders could be, could be quite significant amongst the school population, could be. In terms of national statistics that I picked out, it sort of tends to follow through my information. One in 10 teenage girls suffer from some form of eating disorder. The average age of onset of an eating disorder between 40 and 60. 50 to 80% of young girls fear becoming fat. That's a statistic gained in our school. 50 to 80% of a recent survey that we did into our students. Which is quite frightening. In our school alone, that's done across the whole school. Okay, so if we look at the factors as far as I understand it in terms of eating disorders, the context of our school, if we're looking at the psychological factors, low self esteem, now you might think. Well, actually, students coming to our school wouldn't have low self-esteem. You'd think high-achieving girls actually coming to our school, their self-esteem would actually be pretty good. Sadly, in some cases, that is not the case. And the reason for it is that in some cases, their self-esteem takes a knock. It takes a knock because moving from a primary school or a middle school in previous years where they're seen as a big fish in a relatively small pond, they move into a big pond and they're now a relatively small fish. And we have to work very hard in terms of induction procedures and induction styles and induction methods to overcome some of those issues of self-esteem. When you're also dealing with a limited ability range, those at the very top end are exceedingly bright. I would say that they are far, far brighter than ever I was, am, or ever will be. Now, if you're at the bottom end of that, and you're looking up at the brightest, there's a difficulty there. So we're bound to have some self-esteem issues. A lack of control, that could apply to any school. Teenagers feel pressure, and they feel lack of control in their lives. They have that lack of control. Parents, school, where do they control themselves? Where do they have that lifestyle that allows them to be themselves, that allows them the time, the freedom, the flexibility to be themselves, to make their own decisions? In a society where we are constantly, and I heard the phrase the other day, bubble wrapping our children, taking them to school, bringing them home, taking them to clubs, taking them to activities, constantly, constantly shielding them from risk and risk aversion that we have these days. That control is gone for a lot of our teenagers. So, lack of control. For our high-achieving girls, perfectionism. 
If I tell you that some of our girls will spend hour upon hour doing homework when we explicitly tell them 30 minutes max, and they'll get to the end of a piece of work, they'll make one mistake at the end, they'll rip it all up and start again. One of the factors, depression. I'm not saying that all of our kids suffer from depression, I'm not going to say that. But there is an increase in depression within teenagers, maybe as a result of what they can tell. Difficulties in expressing emotions, the interpersonal factors. Kids don't have time to sit back and think about those emotions that are whirling around inside their heads. Being able to think about what's going on in my head. What am I feeling? What am I thinking? Instances of abuse and bullying. Only takes one person to say to another teenager in a form room, you're looking a bit fat these days, bang. One person. One small word, the word fat. One person can influence. Let me come on to social factors. I'm not sure whether social factors are flogged too much, but I think they should be. Social media, the perfect body. I don't know how many of you know this statistic, but for girls that look at magazines, uh, magazines, I, can't, I don't know what they are these days, I don't read them, I'm afraid, um, but any of the girl, teenage magazines um, that you can think of that you'll see in teenage bedrooms, if you can ever get in them, um, if you can ever find your way through the mess that they might create, um, if they spend 60 minutes looking at a teenage magazine, according to one particular statistic I read the other day, then that statistic suggests that it lowers their self-esteem of girls by 80%. 60 minutes. 80. Don't know how long for but it has an impact because what's being presented to them is the perfect body image. The perfect image, the perfect way to look, the perfect ideal. Our girls are subjected to that all of the time. You see it in the classroom, you see it at lunchtime, the magazines, the photographs, all of the stuff that comes out during lunchtime during break time, all the time. And the narrow definitions that we have of beauty, what the girls understand of beauty, what is beauty to them? You go and ask them, and they'll tell you, and it's not what you think it is. And those cultural norms, what do we value in society these days? We value the celebrity culture that's what teenagers hold up. They hold up the celebrity culture. What do they want? They want the quick fix. They want their five minutes of fame. They want their five minutes of being on The Voice, even if they can't sing. They want their five minutes in Planet's Got Talent or whatever other reality show that happens to be there. Because we value external. We don't think about internal. We don't think about the values that we may hold because that's not valued. It's what's in front of us, what we see, our perception. And then there are biological factors that may come into play. Some genetic considerations. Some of the cases that I've dealt with with eating disorders. When we start dealing with those cases, we very often find over a period of months that there's a history of eating disorders within the family. 
Now, is that genetic? I don't know. I'm not a scientist. But there is some evidence to suggest that that may be possible. And there is more recent scientific suggestions to say that there's a possible biochemical link. Possible. Again, I'm not a scientist. I won't bring that um, to this particular forum. <coughs> okay, so that's the question for us, specifically for our school. How do we achieve the student's academic potential and maximize the facilitation of their social and emotional well-being? That's a conflict for me as a pastoral deputy. How do I make sure that the youngsters in my care, who I want to come into school feeling happy, healthy, content, confident, upright young ladies, how do I want them to be able to be like that and at the same time achieve happily their academic potential. Because I want all of my kids, all 1,250 of them, to come in to be happy, to be confident, to be secure. That's my one aim in my school. And I tell you, it cuts me up every single time when there's a mental health issue, when there's a child abuse case, when there's something that hurts a youngster in one school. It really does, because it's not fair, for whatever reason. So how do I achieve it? I've got a quote for you, okay? I can't pronounce the name of the person who's written it or said it, so I'm not going to quote the name of the person. But this underpins what I think is really, really important. Surely a school is a place where one learns about the totality, the wholeness of life. Academic excellence is necessary, but a school includes much more than that. It is a place where the teacher and the taught explore not only the outer world, the world of knowledge, but also their own thinking, their own behaviour. For me, that's important. It's not just about academic excellence. It's not about targets. It's not about grades. Yes, they're important, but it's about holistic education. So, how do we try and achieve it? And I said right at the beginning, we're not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. We try and do it overtly, and we try and do it covertly. Okay. It's easier to show you the overt stuff, but I'm going to show you, tell you some of the covert stuff later on. This is the overt stuff. We use curriculum time. We use what's called PSHE. And PSHE is, for those of you that aren't aware, is personal, social, and health education. The students have, in each year group, have one hour per fortnight on their timetable where they are delivered personal, social, health education. Part of it is compulsory, all of the sex education stuff that we have to do, which the government tells us to do. But some of it is through our own design. And it's worked on a spiral curriculum. So in other words, what we try and do is we introduce things in a very gentle, straightforward way in year seven, and we gradually build and develop to more complex, more difficult, and more harsh things as the year progresses. And it becomes more difficult and it becomes more conceptually more difficult, and it also becomes much more thought-provoking as the year develops, or as the years develop. 
Our Year 7 curriculum, we also use what are called Year 12 and Year 11 PSHG peer mentors. Now these are students from Year 12 and from Year 11 that assist our teachers in the classroom. And what we found with our peer mentors, we fully train them, they don't go in straight away, they have full safeguarding training, and they have training in how to question, how to deliver uh, lessons, how to uh, work in group work situations. Because all of our PSHG program is evaluated, not by our staff, but by our students. Our students will evaluate each lesson that is delivered within the PSHG program. And they evaluate it anonymously via our intranet. There is a feedback button on our intranet for each PSHG lesson for each tutor group. And the teacher will ask two students at random to come up at the end of the lesson or in a subsequent tutor group lesson to say, Will you give some feedback on what you've just, uh, on the PSHG session that you've just done? And it comes in a feedback thread back to me as a PSHG coordinator, so that I know what they thought about that particular lesson, what they thought about the content, what they thought about the ideas and the delivery. And one of the things that the students said, particularly in year seven and in year eight, two years ago, was that they said that they would like to talk to older students about things that they felt uncomfortable talking to members of staff about. And so we decided that we would introduce and train students from 12 and from 11 to go in and do small group work with those year 7 and year 8 students so that they could actually talk without being concerned about having to talk with members of staff in front of the whole group or whatever else. And it's been very, very successful. It's been very beneficial on a two-way basis, both from the youngsters in year seven and eight, and also from the peer mentors themselves, because they've actually got a, a lot out of it. Now, you may say, well, what's this got to do with eating disorders? Okay, it's got a lot to do with eating disorders, because what the evaluation also said two to three years ago was that the students wanted, all of the students in all year groups wanted a lot more information on mental health issues in every single year group. They said, we've had enough of road safety and red squirrel or whatever it used to be, um, green man or whatever. We don't want that. Um, we don't want any of this. We want mental health. And we want to know. So, okay. So, how do we devise a curriculum, a spiral curriculum, which enables us to deal with eating disorders. And we've introduced a series of lessons into our PSHG which help us to get students thinking about eating disorders and be able to begin to be aware of the issues surrounding eating disorders. So we do something on body image. We have a fashion show, which is a positive fashion show displaying positive body image. And all of our year sevens go on a fashion show. They have to design their own clothes and it has to be a positive presentation of positive body image. Um, and we also run a session particularly on bullying around issues of fatness. In year eight, we introduce the idea of healthy eating. Uh, we also introduce a topic called SEAL, and if you've not heard of SEAL, it's not about clapping, but it's about social, emotional aspects of learning, and again about relationships. But one of the things that we've introduced for this year is a course on mindfulness. And if you are aware of mindfulness, mindfulness is the idea of giving students the time and space to be able to think about their emotions. So we're developing the skills of mindfulness amongst our students so that they're able to relax, de-stress, and they actually have two sessions, 
where they're developing the skills of being able to get out of the rat race of lesson time and be able to develop those skills of being able to becoming mind and in being so that they're being able to think about their own emotions and being able to interpret those emotions. Because very often, if you remember back through the slides, one of the things I was talking about was teenagers' inability to be able to think through their own emotions. And we need to give time and space for those students to be able to think through those emotions and to be able to interpret and explain what those emotions are about. So we're introducing emotional well-being into our curriculum. In year nine, again, we're building on the skills of emotional well-being and developing those skills further. We also introduce yoga, and we're introducing this year into our year 10, um, this year, which isn't on this slide, but we're introducing laughter yoga. I don't know if you've come across laughter yoga. Um, it's a, a new thing that we've introduced. Uh, we've got somebody trained who now delivers laughter yoga um, to tutor groups, um, and it's going down exceedingly well. Uh, raising awareness of mental health issues, dealing with the spectrum of mental health issues, and this is where it becomes a little bit sharper with our students. We introduce the idea of when food becomes an enemy. Um, and then into year 10, we look at body shop and how uh, digital media and digital manipulation introduces the idea of body shape and perfect body um, self-harm. And we link into I eat uh, and sessions on I eat from I eat. And then into year 12 and 13, 11, 12 and 13, uh, yoga, dealing with social media and women's health and so on. So that we're actually developing a curriculum that is enabling students to have more and more developed contact with the issues surrounding um, eating disorders and developing those skills to be able to deal with them as well. We also offer further support through our curriculum. Physical education offers a healthy lifestyle course. Our science offers uh, nutrition and diet. Um, and with the drama and our other subjects, we also do role play, which develops further, in particular, not on healthy, uh, on eating disorders per se, but about support issues that friends have when they discover that one of their friends has an eating disorder and how you actually deal with that. Because that's one of the issues that we're concentrating on at the moment, is how do we support the friends who discover that their friend has an eating disorder? And that's a big issue at the moment. <coughs> Outside of the curriculum, we have found a demand, a very high demand as a result of what we've done within our ESOG sessions, um, for mindfulness sessions after school. And we now run two mindfulness sessions, um, one for our Key Stage 4 and Key Stage 5 students, and one for our Key Stage 3 students. And these are a series of 12 sessions, they are taught sessions, and they lead through the skills of developing mindfulness. And by the end of the 12 sessions, each student is fully equipped to be able to run their own mindfulness session for themselves to develop those relaxation techniques and to be able to then consequently create their own mind being and their own ability to be able to sort through their own emotions. And we hope that that way we're dealing with, overtly, we're dealing with issues related to mental health, but also particularly issues related to um, eating disorders. So how do we deal specifically with a, a student that has an eating disorder? First of all, as a school, we recognize that we have an issue with eating disorders. 
and that's quite important to mention. Um, so therefore we have a policy and that policy will define our practice. Um, that policy was designed um, in conjunction with Ireland, with Jess, Jess Griffiths, um, and we have a clear set of aims as to what we want to achieve with that particular policy. And within that policy, we'll identify a core group of staff who will work with an individual student that has an eating disorder. <coughs> and it has, within the policy, a flowchart that will indicate how we will support that particular student through um, treatment and through schooling issues. And it will also identify how we will support uh, family, carer, um, and friends. And as I've said previously, the friendship issue is something uh, that we are working on currently. So the core group of staff and the referrals that we can make, um, we have a school counsellor on site um, four days a week um, who gets a large number of referrals. We try as early identification as we possibly can. And the school counsellor um, is a point of reference for a very early identification if possible. We have a school nurse. Um, unfortunately, school nursing services is suffering from cuts um, from government services and it's very difficult for them at the moment, um, particularly with all of the uh, vaccination programmes that they have to deal with in the schools. Um, and we're hopeful um, that we will have an eating disorders practitioner on site as well within the school for a limited period of time, but that we will then work together, school counsellor, eating disorders practitioner, um, to prevent referral to Whiteheads. Whiteheads is a young person's eating disorder service, and that is when it's really serious. We hope that we can avoid that referral, that we can work at a very early stage, early identification, to work with the student, to work with the parents, to prevent that referral going to white pets, so that we can manage the student with the eating disorder, manage their schooling successfully, because one of the issues we have in students going to white pets, as soon as they go to white pets, the schooling is stopped. And of course, one of the problems with a student experiencing eating disorders is the importance of socialization, being able to be with friends. And once you're in white pets with particular weight issues, you may not be allowed into school. And that socialization problem then really kicks off. And I'm one for having students being able to be in school, perhaps on a part-time timetable, and being able to socialize with friends, being part of a part-time timetable, and that encouragement of being able to build up that part-time timetable. Obviously, the GP is also involved um, as well. We do also spend and have spent a lot of time in terms of training and raising awareness. Uh, training for our pastoral staff, I would say, I would be proud to say that I have a good pastoral staff within the school. Um, heads of year, assistant heads of year, um, are very good within the school and they are trained very thoroughly in awareness of eating disorders but not just in awareness but in terms of language and that was something that I said we are covert as well as overt and language is all important language as to how you speak with a student that has an eating disorder and about how you welcome back a student that's coming into school with an eating disorder in recovery and coming back into school. And the key
can and you use with that language. Really, really important. Awareness raising with our whole staff and the language that's used with our whole staff to make sure that an error is not made. Something like, oh, you're looking fantastic. <clears throat> Big mistake. It's nice to see you back in school. It's a far better option. And making sure that that language is good enough for the student to be able to come back into school feeling comfortable. And we spent a lot of time with our staff talking about making sure that, yeah, our staff are under pressure and they're under stress, but making sure that they don't pass that stress and pressure onto our students. That's really, really important. We've tried parents' evenings, not very successful. They're a bit like the old sex education parents' evenings that we used to have to give, where we'd get a couple of interested parents, possibly one man and a dog who wandered in and said, oh, I'm in the wrong meeting. Um, same with parents for eating disorders. We're going to try something slightly different this year, where we're going to have a back-to-school evening. Parents seem very keen on back to school evenings, but we're not going to tell them what it's about. And then we're going to do some PSAG sessions. Um, and I think that might be quite useful um, for them to see what we're delivering in PSAG sessions, but not actually tell them that we're going to do that. And we just say, we're going to have a back to school evening, so you can all come in and see what the children are learning, um, and then do some PSAG sessions. Um, so that we might win it that way. Because I don't know what it is with secondary schools. With primary schools, you, parents will come in at the drop of a hat. But once you move into secondary school, it's awfully difficult to get parents engaged, apart from parents' evenings. Anything else? I, I'm running an e-safety uh, parents' evening um, after Easter. And I know I'm going to get possibly 15, um, if I'm lucky. So it's about how you engage parents into those sorts of activities. Uh, and that's what I'm thinking. I'm, I might be generalizing again, which I've been told off with um, so far. So there are barriers to our success rate. We have to recognize that. I recognize that. Obviously, one of the barriers is, is the students themselves, because students that experience these disorders are very clever at hiding it and it's very difficult for us to spot it sometimes and we do miss it the bag and pose and, and all the other ways in which they can hide what they're doing it's very difficult for us to spot particularly in a busy environment a busy workplace a very busy school a very busy community it is difficult to spot um, as i say fortunately our pastoral staff pretty good um, and they, they will become most things but it is difficult when you've got high achieving the girls um, who can hide it very very easily um, you know, they, they will hide it and they are very very clever at hiding it parents <coughs> parents are barriers unfortunately Parents, for us parents, do, do act as a, as a barrier for, for a number of reasons. We get different responses from parents. Um, we get some parents who say, gosh, I'm so ashamed. What have I done wrong? And parents have done nothing wrong. But the reaction is, I'm so ashamed. Um, how can you help me? which is brilliant. Then you'll get the parent who says, um, oh, well, I don't believe it. There's nothing wrong with my child. You're overreacting. Uh, I don't want anything done about it. Leave us alone. And there's nothing more we can do. And uh, there's the parent who 
says, um, I'm ashamed, uh, leave me alone. Don't talk to my child. And again, there's nothing we can do about it. And there are some parents who will turn around and say, it's your fault. Why did you let my child do this? <coughs> they are the most difficult conversations where you have a parent who is yelling down the phone blaming you as an individual or the school for the problem. And that is, that is hard. That's hard. Um, because we don't spot, we don't see, and we make mistakes. We broach too early, we broach too late. Um, it does happen. And of course, mm -hmm. I blame social media for a lot of stuff. 